prohibition shaped the general attitude of the people of this land, other lands, and wherever we go. In the most southerly isles of the Caribbean archipelago lie the twin island republic of Trinidad and Tobago. After Trinidad's discovery by Christopher Columbus in 1498, it remained a Spanish colony until the British took control in the 18th century and brought Africans as slaves to work on the sugarcane plantations. The colony absorbed diverse groups of African peoples who came with their own history and culture a culture that was forced underground by the colonial authorities. However, with emancipation in 1838, some of the once enslaved Africans began to practice the religions they brought with them. Others chose the prevailing denominations of the status quo, and some combined African traditions with Christianity. One such religion that adopted this approach was the spiritual Shouta Baptists, and although several theories attempt to explain the origin of this unique religious group, which developed in Trinidad, one theory is based firmly on African slavery. I was told, and I believe it came from out of slavery, and seeing that we have been emancipated, they came up to higher grounds and they did not practice the way that they used to. The practice of this faith included a mode of worship which included bell ringing, hand clapping and loud praying and singing. It was precisely because of the volume and vibrancy with which members of the faith practiced their religion that mainstream society began to label them as shouters, unperturbed by what was intended to be a derogatory title. The shouters continued to demonstrate their cultural autonomy through religious practices that were different to European systems, as they blended African and Christian traditions and adopted and adapted practices and beliefs masking one with the other. Criminologist Professor Unwubiko Agozino at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, explains. The cultural innovations that the African diaspora relied upon to survive 400 years of Holocaust that resulted in the death of uh, tens of millions of Africans, but the ones that survived, relied on these strong religious and spiritual traditions as part of the resources that made it possible for them to survive the Holocaust. Indeed, while the ex-slaves and their descendants relied on strong religious and spiritual traditions to survive, and so gave rise to the spiritual Shouter Baptist faith, the initiation of the faith is attributed to the baptism of Jesus on the banks of the Jordan River. Leader Deidre Springer, now 98, who was the officiating minister of the Mount Carmel Spiritual Baptist Church in Komuto from 1946 until 2006, attributes the call of the Baptist faith to the biblical John the Baptist. From the days of John the Baptist, when he came preaching in the wilderness, and the multitude of people went to him to be baptized. Colonialism brought to the Caribbean a Eurocentric Christianity, but as the spiritual Shouter Baptist faith evolved, they developed a unique Afrocentric Christianity, one which contrasted with the colonial church's rather conservative method of worship. Archbishop Barbara Burke comments on how the historical origin of the spiritual Shopta Baptist faith in Trinidad contrasted with that of the Eurocentric conformist churches and how this impacted on its perception. They had nothing really documented where the first church was formed. 
But most of the churches is all on the mountain, all behind a house. They could not settle as the conformist churches. The conformist churches had the opportunity to build the churches in Port of Spain, wherever they feel. But the Baptists had to be hiding all in the hills and the mountain. Our faith is indigenous. And because of this, your neighbors, your friends, didn't get an appreciation to understand what is the meaning of your faith. The indigenous nature of a faith, which was making significant inroads on the established churches, coupled with its differing cultural practices from these conformist churches, ignited the intolerance of property owners and taxpayers, who, through the Legislative Council, influenced the colonial authorities to act on the matter. And in 1917, the religion was prohibited and its religious practices outlawed. ordinance under which the activities of the spiritual shouters became illegal is known as the practice of the body known as the shouters and dated November 17, 1917, we were banned. This act was first introduced into the Legislative Council of Trinidad and Tobago under the enactment of the then Attorney General, Sir Henry Golan, that's the man. This law rigidly enforced by the constabulary. Violators of the law were arrested, beaten, brought to trial by the police. The magistrate decision was final. If you tie in a head with white cloth, they say it was against the law. Ringing of a bell at intervals during meeting. Now we really carry on a worship, and you will see a sister or brother get up and he start to ring the bell. And all this they find, they, they, they said it, it was demons, they demonized the religion. Holding of a lighted candle, or, or, or we, we are grounded by holding a candle in our hands. Violent shaking, but we just shake <clears throat> and, sh and shout. And they say violent shaking of the body and limbs. They also say shouting and groaning. What they mean by shouting and groaning? We would say <clears throat> <clears throat> And this is, this are the things we were outlawed for. Outlawed for the practice of their faith, adherents of the spiritual Baptist religion provide insights on the persecution of its members. The government, the law in those years, they don't want the Baptist people to, to preach. Especially they give you a time after 10, after 10 o'clock, they caught you preaching or carrying on any prayers, they say you're shouting. They will punish you seven days or charge you five shillings. The Baptists in those days, they had to run in the bush, hide in the bush police behind us. You know? Shepherd Jeffrey Warwick, in a stirring sermon, comments on the underlying source of conflict between Baptists and the colonial government at that time. We were considered to be aliens. My God. Yes. We were considered not to be a people. My Lord. We were beaten. Yes. We had to run from the police because we were unable to worship our God.
The first case brought against the shelters under the 1917 Prohibition Ordinance was heard at the Chagornas Police Court on 8th January 1918. The actual arrest of the 14 shelters, led by Teacher Bailey, actually took place at Perseverance Village on the night of 17th December 1917. Teacher Bailey, described in the headline of Trinidad Guardian as an obstinate fellow, earned this title because of the number of times he had been arrested for carrying on shelter meetings. This man they call Teacher Bailey, they prepare to go to jail morning, noon and night. And at one time when they arrest him, he made them to understand that he Bible is a chart and he compass. And he Bible and if and if he intend to be a jailbird for serving Almighty God. It is clear that Teacher Bailey's religious convictions led him and other shelter Baptists, like himself, to show neither recognition of the ordinance nor fear of the consequences in engaging in its disobedience. In this way, the spiritual shelter Baptists began their non-violent resistance in 1917 and continued this form of protest for the next 33 years. Archbishop Monica Randu, mother of the Judah Spiritual Baptist Church in Kokorit, who was herself part of the resistance in the later years of Prohibition, explained the Shouter Baptist strategy of resistance. We resi resisted by being public. Although we went to the hills, although we were in, 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 in clothes, we were vis very visible in the capital, Port of Spain. We were the mayors and the mayors of the spiritual battleground in Port of Spain. San Fernando, Erin, Toco, name it, Monjablo, Caranaj. Every community had shouted and still have. Despite persecution and prosecution, the spiritual shelter Baptist groups continued to grow, and with it, a protest against the shelter prohibition ordinance developed, aided by public figures like trade union leader Uriah Buzz Butler, who himself was influenced by the faith and its politics. Start protesting, and what make it better when Butler and they bring out this this um, voting where the Baptist people get a, a hold. Mother Monica Randu presents not only the fundamental argument of the right to worship, which the shelters used to win their liberation, but she also explores the effect prohibition had on members themselves, especially its effect on the elders of the faith who championed its liberation. Why it is that if we are all citizens, if we all have rights, if we are every creed and race, if we find an equal place, why it is this body of people is chastised by Her Majesty's government, a law enacted by the colonial government of the then day, and you are practicing from Her Majesty's King James Version Bible, on the other side, they have the same Bible, but the law is written there and enacted that any time you try to practice as you seem fit and as God inspire you, you will be chastised by a penalty of the law which you cannot appeal 
you would be sent to jail. Therefore, you are what you call not left to develop or to grow or to expand. You are stifled and you are pressed down and you are being erased from the map of your homeland in the religious sense where persons who brought their identical way of worship from overseas and yours from right here you cannot practice it prohibition has done just what slavery has done to the african people and it will take time and only god almighty of himself is the one who had the power to do the rescuing to break that and it took a man called elton george griffith the late pioneer liberator of the shouter baptist faith it took him granville williams and all the other elders of the faith to be bold not fearing man and place their lives in danger persistent protest can be a dangerous activity yet bishop elton george griffith and others took a non-violent approach and lobbied and petitioned the legislative council for another 10 years in 1949 a select committee chaired by Sir Leonard Courtney Hannes was set up to investigate and report on the matter of the Shouters Prohibition Ordinance. And on 30th March 1951, the Shouters Prohibition Ordinance was repealed. When the Shouter Baptists won their liberation on 30th March 1951, they left the building which housed the Legislative Council the place that is today known as the Red House, and they poured into the nearby Woodford Square and towards the bandstand to hold the first legal Shouter Baptist Thanksgiving service led by leader A.J. Balfour. The African philosophy of nonviolence is often the best way to resist injustice and the Shout the Baptists demonstrated they did not kill anybody during all those years of unjust prohibition. They didn't even fight physically. They used moral and intellectual arguments to win their liberation. But the question remains, what was the effect then and now of the Shouter Prohibition Act? both on the members of the faith and on the general public. When you go to hospital or wherever, they will tell you, don't say you are the Baptist. So we maintain that because it was a shame of the conditions of the, what the Baptist was going through because we was degraded. From the time you say you are the Spirit, they look at you as nothing at all. Prohibition shaped the general attitude of the people of this land, other lands, and wherever we go. It has done a damage in the psyche of the people that is Shouter Baptist in relation to the retention of that which they did to us in the act from 1917 to 1951. The major damage is really the lack of respect for the law when the law behaves in an unreasonable manner by, for example, trying to un outlaw the faith of responsible adults and children in the community. It breeds a form of hatred or disregard for the law. What could our society or the international community have learnt through the Shouters' experience of prohibition? The society would have learnt from the spiritual Baptist people the enactment of the law, um, the prohibition law, that it was a terrible thing to do and to deal with people. You ought not 
to subdue a people by law. You ought not to oppress a people by law. The law which you want to encapsulate as to cause a, what you call a development for visions that you may have for the coming years. It has hampered the nation because it has taught the nation how to disrespect your own people. It has hampered our nation because you let a people be subdued. You let a people, your own people, be ostracized, humiliated, beaten down. You see what the law can do. The major lesson from the history of the shadows, as I see it, is that uh, we live in societies that are control freak societies that try to control everything, including things that are beyond the control of people in authority. When the social control of a religion is achieved by people in authority through a law that permits practitioners of the faith for their crime of disobedience against the law, who are the victims? Who were the victims of the Shouter Baptists' criminal acts of disobedience? Who was the victim here? There was no victim when Shouter Baptists say their prayers and spray lotions and ring their bells and light candles and shout and shake their body to honor their God. Who's the victim? As criminologists today ponder the idea of victimless crimes, others are forced to arrive at a conclusion about power and its offspring, laws and its conception, and crime with its many manifestations at birth. Imperialism is the major form of crime. Almost every crime in the world can be understood in terms of invading the space of other people and trying to colonize their private or community space. So if we look at the history of the Shadow Baptists, we find that the colonial authorities, of course, being imperialistic, we are trying to colonize the religious space of the Shadow Baptists. That in itself should be a criminal act. The attempt to outlaw the Shadow Baptists was a violation of their rights and therefore should be against the constitution of England at that time, which recognized the freedom of worship. And so it should be recognizing itself as a crime of the state against the people. And the Shadow Baptist members should therefore be recognized as victims or people who were victimized by this colonial crime that represented them as if they were the ones who were the criminals. After years of prosecution and being classed as criminals for practicing their faith, the spiritual Shouter Baptists can today make a joyful noise unto the Lord and sing His praises as they follow their beliefs unhindered by the laws of the land. We born here, this religion form here, and we must have equality of serving God as we choose. Not as how man or government wants us to serve God. Yes,
When they go by Mother Weeks, Mother Beryl and them and they kneel down, they hear they saying, Oh God, our help in it is past. Master, oh, look your daughter call. Hey, hey, come and meet me here. Oh God, meet me now. And my tongue not sufficient to call you blessed. I look my tongue in my mouth. Lord, oh God, forgive me. If anything I done wrong, it go cleave to my mouth. Purify me to come. Ah, purify me to come. I know where I am going. I know. I know where I am going. I know. Yes, I know. Joy bells are ringing. Happy children are singing. I know where I am going. I know. I am going up to Mount Zion. I know. I am going up to Mount Zion.